So Luke chapter 3, verse 1, let's read. It reads like this. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate became governor of Judea. Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Eturia, and the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene. While Annas and Caiaphas were high priests, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places will be made straight, and the rough ways be made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Then John said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, Hey, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So the people asked him, saying, What do we do then? John answered and he said to them, He who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. He who has food, let him do likewise. Then tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to John, Teacher, what shall we do? John said to them, Collect no more than what is appointed for you. Likewise, the soldiers asked him, saying, And what shall we do? So he said to them, Do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely, and be content with what wages you, serve, you receive. Now as the people were in expectation and all reasoned in their hearts about John, whether he was the Christ or not, John answered, saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water. But one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And with many other exhortations, he preached to the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, being rebuked by John concerning Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, also added this, above all, that he shut up John in prison. Let me point out a few things this morning about the salvation of God. And I'm going to ask a couple of questions, and then I'll just respond to those. And if there's comments that you would like to make, I encourage you to do that on the screen to your right. And uh, just hear what I'm saying today as, as we talk about it. First of all, it is the right of every man every living person to be saved. You have that right. It's, not, it's really not even a right. It is a uh, blessing. It is the grace of God pointed at you. It is an opportunity for you to know the real you or the real person you could become. Salvation is a gift. Again, an opportunity for you to know God the way that He wants you to know Him and the way that He wants to know you. So let's talk about the salvation of God and John's response and John's interaction or John's um, uh, position with the people that approached him as he began to teach about the kingdom. First of all, what was John's response to the call of God in verses 2 and 3? Question 1. 2. What was the people's response? to John's abrasive and harsh question in verse 7. And three, was John's question and tone actually necessary? So let's address those quickly and then go through a few other things. Again, question one. What was John's response to the call of God in verses 2 and 3? Well, let's read those verses real quickly one more time. Verses 2 and 3 says, While Annas and Caiaphas were high priests, the word of God, the word of God, the word of Yahweh, came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. When it came to him, 
He went into all the region around Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. First of all, John's response to the call of God in 2 and 3 was, he heard the call, one. Two, he didn't argue it. He didn't debate it. He didn't try to figure out another option. He didn't say, I could make more money doing this or make more money doing that. John's response to the call of God was, I hear your call, and this is what I'm going to do. The next step I take will be in pursuit of what you've called me to do. Now, don't misunderstand me and believe for a second that that means that every person that gets saved today or comes to the place where they repent and come into relationship with God, don't misunderstand me and, and, and believe that everyone's going to be preachers in the way that John was or the way that I am or the way that pastors or fivefold ministers are. But every person that comes into the salvation of God will become an instrument of life to every person that they come in contact with. Very similar to what John is doing here. So question two, what was the people's response to John's abrasive and harsh question in verse seven? So let's read verse seven. Then John said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, brood of vipers. He was, it wasn't nice. He didn't say, oh, you poor folks. He didn't say, oh my goodness, I, I'm just, just come here and just let me wrap my arms around you, just love on you for a minute because poor you, you just, you just don't get it. He said, you bunch of vipers, you bunch of rascals. And then he goes and he says, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? In other words, you're all believers, quote unquote, religious people that are coming in this particular sentence. He's addressing those who are full of religion. But he said, who warned you? Because as long as you've been following religion, there is no voice, prophetic voice in religion. There is no voice in religion that will point the way. Religion will only point you back to what you've already learned. It will never reveal to you the newness and the, the present Word of God. It's always going to point you back to what has already been spoken and never give you an opportunity to actually become the person you're supposed to be. So John said, who warned you? Religion couldn't have told you this. Because religion, it's out to kill you, not build you. So in that response, uh, what was his response? To, what was their response to this? I love what they follow it up with. He says, bear fruits worthy of repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. What does that mean? John's saying to them, he's, he's saying, it's not good enough that your daddy, your granddaddy, your pappy, your this person or that person knew God. You need to know God. Because Knowing or being in the lineage of someone who was righteous and who lived a righteous life and served the Father with all their heart, soul, and mind does not qualify you to be counted among the saints, to be counted among the righteous, or furthermore, to be counted among the saved. Salvation, the salvation of God comes to every single individual, and it is not through heritage. It is through the, an individual decision that each and every single person makes. So his response or their response to John's abrasive and harsh question in verse 7 is that they begin to ask questions and say, what do we do then? John, now that you've made it clear to us that religion won't work for us, that just being the son or daughter of a righteous man isn't enough, what do we do then? And then the third question I asked that maybe I could have asked before even question two is, was his question and tone, was John's question and tone necessary? Now I can't find in Scripture where I can validate that it was necessary only to say that the fruit of the tone absolutely produced a good result. Sometimes it takes a sharp tone to wake people up. This is the nature religion today will never. You'll never find a sharp tone in religion. You'll never find a sharp tone behind a pulpit of a, of a, a man or a woman that is preaching from a religious place today because they're afraid that they might lose somebody. What they more need to be afraid of is not the people that they lose that are in the house because they don't like that he's breaking tradition. They more need to fear the people that they lose that are outside of the house that are looking for true and genuine salvation. And so John's tone was absolutely necessary because he was trying to wake up the dead. 
He was waking up the dead. Uh, first, one must accept that religion always puts people in a coma. Religion, if you need somebody, if you want to put somebody to sleep, get religious with them. You want to knock somebody out, get religious. You want them to stop coming to your table, just get religious. Beat them over the head with the Bible. Start quoting 14 scriptures. Every time they say something, make sure that you come back with another good scripture. It puts people in a coma. They, they knock out, they leave, they go away, and they'll never come back. You want people out of your life? Get religious with them. Don't get jiggy with them. Get religious with them. Because that will knock them out quick. It laws, Religion laws you and they in, laws every single person into a dreamland of false hopes and empty promises. Why? Because there's no life in religion. There's memorization. There's rehearsed prayers. There's uh, little short quips here and there. But there's no life. There's no living in religion because religion can't provide that because it doesn't have life in itself. Religion is not the same as relationship. It is not the same. Salvation does not produce religion. Salvation produces relationship. 100% of the time, again, let me say it again, salvation does not produce religion. Salvation produces relationship, and that relationship is the one by whom salvation comes, and that is Yahweh God through His Son, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. So let's go over a few points now to talk about salvation and what does it actually mean. One, what is salvation? Let me read you a few things here. What it isn't is a short prayer and a walk to the altar. It is a changed heart, mind, and purpose. John's sharp question was necessary to shake the religion that imprisoned those that at that time he was speaking to. He needed to be sharp because their little short prayers and walks to this altar and that altar and into this temple and that temple wasn't producing anything. They found their peace in God because they knew somebody who knew God, but they did not know God. Their hearts were not changed. They did not understand that they had a purpose of their own and that Yahweh had a purpose for them. So what is salvation? It is when a man accepts that there is more to the kingdom of God than what I've memorized. There's more to the kingdom of God than what I can pray in an hour. You can't, if your salvation with God is determined by how many hours you pray in a day, you'll never be saved enough. You'll never have enough religion because you will work yourself to death trying to become something in God that religion can never produce. All of its rules and laws and regulations. But relationship differs from person to person yet revolves around the same thing. What did you say, Father? That's what I'll do. What's your word to me? I'm going to honor that through obedience. Salvation is trusting Him, receiving His Son, Jesus Christ, accepting that He is your only door to the kingdom. And once you've accepted Him, allowing Him to change your heart, to change your mind, and to reveal His purpose, and then pursuing that with everything that is in you. That is salvation. Two, what does salvation look like? Well, Here's a few things to think about. One, it doesn't glow in the dark and it isn't a halo on top of your head. It doesn't say Jesus' name at the end of every sentence or dress in sandals in a robe. However, it does reflect, like I said before, a changed attitude and a genuine hunger to know Yahweh. Do, how do I know if I'm saved? Find out what you're hungry for. You want to know if you're saved, what are you hunger for? If it doesn't bother you that you do things that violate or dishonor God, I'm going to make it plain for you. You're not saved. He has not brought you to a place where you hunger yet for the things of God. It looks like 
It, it births, salvation births a desire in you to not just serve yourself, to not just see that your needs are met, but to begin to serve others and then be compassionate towards others. It looks like a changed life. It looks like a renewing that has taken place in that particular individual. It isn't because I do so many good things that I'm saved. It is because all of a sudden, receiving Christ has begun to cause something to change in me. It's, it's, it's renewed a hunger in me. It's renewed a fire in me. I'm no longer in a spiritual coma. I'm no longer... Uh, dependent on how many scriptures I read today or how long I prayed today to feel like I've done something right for God. But it's what have I done today to honor Him? Did I not cuss the guy out that ran me over in the road? Did I honor my wife? Was I good to my kids? Have I been faithful in my finances? Have I honored Him with my tithe and my offering? Have I respected Him and, and become a part of the fellowship of believers? Have I gathered with other believers? Do I bring myself into a place where I am drawing from others and I'm being a voice to them? Have I positioned myself to allow Holy Spirit to work in me and to do that with integrity and honesty? Have I been positioned myself to be open and to not have to be right every time and to say, you know what, God, you're working in me and I'm going to let you do that? I don't have to have the last word. That's what salvation looks like. It looks like the hand of God stirring things up in you to the point where you come to the place that no longer bothers you. In fact, you embrace the opportunity for Him to work in your life and put His thumbprint on your forehead and His finger in your heart. Third, what does salvation cost? Do not be mistaken, first of all, because there is a cost. Salvation has a cost. One, for John, it cost him his life. For most of his disciples, most of Christ's disciples, it cost them their life. For you and me, it may not cost us our life. It may. It does from time to time in different places around the world. We're blessed in the United States that to this point, it hasn't so much cost us our life. But around the world, that's not true. Today, we deal with a, a group of terrorists called ISIS that are uh, demonized. They're full of the devil himself. And they will go around and they will kill Christians just for being Christians. They have infected many people, many millions of people to believe the same thing. So for some, salvation does cost them, even today, even in our modern times, does cost them their life. But most assuredly, it will cost you relationships. It will cost you unfair scrutiny and unfair scorn. It will cost you possibly opportunities to be able to do things that, that others may be given opportunity over you. You may find yourself in the natural in some ways coming up short. There's more to this story. I'm not going to finish that statement yet. I'll finish it in a minute. But you may think in your mind you're coming up short. So in the natural, salvation may cost you what you think belongs to you. But in parentheses, I'm going to say, but the Father doesn't think it belongs to you. And it will cost you what hurts most people, your opinion. It's going to cost you your opinion. None of us have the right to have an opinion about what God requires. We don't have the right to have an opinion about what salvation really is. We don't have the authority to have an opinion about whether we are saved or we aren't. Because when it boils down to it, at the end of the day, it's the Father that decides. And the easy way to know that is, if I'm honoring Him, if I'm being faithful to Him, then salvation is working in me. If I'm not honoring Him with my first and my best, and all the things I mentioned earlier, by loving my wife and loving those around me, serving those around me, making a draw on what He's saying to me, being attentive to what He wants to do in my life, if I'm not making a draw on those things, salvation's not in me. It's not in me. It costs me my opinion. I can't just have an opinion and just say, well, I don't think God's that way. He's going to let everybody into heaven. I can tell you today that that is not true. I hope you're one. I believe I'm going to be one. I'm determined that I'm going to be one. But I'm only going to be that and you're only going to be that when we understand that it will cost us something. You're not going to be, do, be able to do all of the things that in your natural man you might want to do. 
But the good news is, in time as salvation continues to work in you and continues to work in me, in time, the things that you want will become the things that he wants. The things that he wants will become what you want. So the battle becomes less intense. Let him work in you today. Yes, salvation has a cost, but I can tell you the cost is worth it. So what are the rewards? Are there any? One, His grace. The reward of salvation is His grace. His willingness to look at you every day and understand that wherever you are, at whatever point you came to know Him, that salvation is a process. I'm being saved every single day. It wasn't a one-time thing. It didn't happen this morning, and I'll never have to look to Him again to renew my heart and spirit. Every day He's renewing my heart and spirit. Every day He'll be renewing your heart and spirit if you'll submit yourself to His hand. Submit yourself to His voice and to His word. And to those He put in your life to bring truth to you and speak truth to you, even if you don't like the tone or you don't like the address, I promise you, the reward of salvation is that He will begin to work in you and begin to change you and His grace will be revealed in you and you will begin to find yourself doing things and, and saying things and becoming something that maybe you didn't even know you could be, but all of a sudden you are becoming that. Another reward of salvation is His favor. His hand begins to work on your behalf. Now, don't mistake His favor for getting everything that you want or that I want. That's not His favor. That's lawlessness. His favor is Him releasing to you and releasing to me those things that can be a blessing to you and me while at the same time bringing glory and honor to Him. The Father will always receive fruit for the seed that He sends to you and me. And one of those things is that He will favor your obedience. He will favor your willingness to come into relationship with Him and to trust Him and to honor Him. In Luke 3, as we read today, we saw where the religious, those who were in a coma, came to John and asked, what do I need to do? The tax collectors came to John and said, what do we need to do? The soldiers came to John and said, what do we need to do? They realized that they had a form of godliness, but there was no power present. There was an interest in godliness, but there was no pursuit of truth. I can tell you that if their hearts were truly changed, and they truly heard what John was preaching to them and received what John was saying to them. Every one of those people, when they shut their eyes at the end of that day, knew that their life would never be the same again. Yahweh would immediately begin to favor them because by favoring those who pursue Him, it causes the earth to begin to ask questions. And Yahweh is jealous for His people. He is jealous about Himself. He is the... One, he's, He is the only God He wants you serving, so He wants to favor you. He doesn't hold it out there like a carrot. He literally wants to put the pie on your plate in your lap so that you can partake of it. He wants to favor you with blessing, with family, with life, with prosperity, with health, and with strength, and with joy and laughter. He wants to favor you with your dreams as long as those things will at the same time bring Him honor and bring Him glory. Because when others see how He favors you, I want to tell you today, when they see it, they will come to you and then the kingdom of God will be what it's promised to be and that is ever increasing. The Father wants to favor you and one of the greatest rewards of salvation is that He will do just that. He will favor you in your rising and He will favor you in your lying down. He will favor you in your most difficult moment. Working for an employer that's the most difficult person to work with. Vile, corrupt, and all those. He will favor you in the middle of that and cause you to be in places within that place that you might not even be qualified for. But He will favor you as a testimony to His Word and His salvation working in you. Another reward is His promises being fulfilled. He said, if you will trust Him, if you will honor Him, if you will believe in Him, and you will have faith in Him, if you will sow seed, that for every seed that you sow, that fruit will return to you on every way. 
He has promised that if you will trust Him and you will declare His faithfulness in all the earth and that you will, you will allow His words to begin to work in you and allow salvation to begin to do its, its work in you, if you will allow it, His promises, His purpose will be fulfilled in your life. His purpose will be fulfilled in your life. Now, in the beginning, His purpose may not look like your purpose, but when you align yourself with His purpose, you will find that's where your greatest joy is. Your greatest joy, my greatest joy, isn't in doing what Steve Parker wants to do or what you want to do. Your greatest joy will be found in doing exactly what the Father has called you to do. That's the reward of salvation because all of a sudden you begin to hear and you begin to understand through that relationship that salvation brings. This is what He created me for. This is why I was born. This is why I live. And you'll find that a reward of salvation is that His purpose for you will be synonymous with your purpose. And you will find that you are fulfilled in it. And then lastly, the reward is true relationship with Yahweh God, who is the only living God. You get out of a coma. When salvation comes to you, when you repent, and you say, Father, I want to know you. I want to repent of anything that's in my life that is contrary to your word and purpose. You wake up. Whatever religion held you captive, whatever ideologies, whatever legalistic system, whatever dogmatic system, whatever chains held you captive and prevented you from coming into the full knowledge of Yahweh God, the full knowledge of Christ, Whatever things that were present there, I want to tell you, salvation, the reward of salvation is you will wake up from the coma that you have been trapped in. You will wake up and come out of that dark room that you have been in and didn't even realize it. Your eyes will see and your ears will hear and the Spirit of God will come alive in you. And cause you to begin to have faith for every promise that He has ever spoken to you. I promise you today that the reward of salvation is that you will come to know God in a true and genuine way. That will never allow you to even question whether He exists. But your voice, His voice, will begin to be heard within your voice. Because you believe again and you believe with passion and you believe with fire, and you have hope, and your dreams once again come alive. I bless you today. This message today is all about the salvation of God. And I know that there are people that are watching right now, and you'll say, I've listened to every word that you've said, Steve Parker. And I don't know that I'm right in my heart. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to pray. But this prayer isn't what's going to get you saved. What causes salvation to come to you is what you do in your own heart. What you do in your own heart. So like the religious man that came to John, like the tax collector that came to John, like this Roman soldier that came to John, just like them, when they came and they asked the question, what must we do? I'm going to answer that question for you right now. What you must do is repent in your heart and say, Father, I want to know you. Wake me up from whatever coma I've been in. Draw me out of whatever dark room I have been in. Let these eyes see that have not seen. Let these ears hear that have not heard so that I may know you. Father, I pray. I lift my voice over every viewer today. Whether they are watching live or whether they are watching a recorded message. I lift my voice over every viewer today. Heal their hearts. Wake them up. Those who are repenting as I pray, wake them up. The power is not in my prayer. The power is in their repentance. Cause them to see. Cause them to hear. Cause them to know that today they are a changed man or a changed woman because of the grace of God, the anointing of Christ, because of the salvation that comes through receiving your Son, Jesus Christ. Cause them to know you, not in some religious way, not in some legalistic way, but in a true life-giving way. 
the way that can only come through relationship with you. Breathe life into the here today. Breathe life into each one today. Forgive them. Change them. Heal them. Raise them up. And may they hunger and thirst after righteousness so that you may be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. This concludes today's message. Thank you for listening and please join us for our weekly celebration of Christ. If you would like more information about The Rock or to receive times and directions, please call 407-688-2445 or visit our website at www.attherock.org. God bless you and your house.